Thank you very much for the renewed invitation to speak in this beautiful series of seminars. So I will essentially read my <coughs> notes and start by defining. So I will speak on this bounded generation linear groups and exponential parameterizations. This is the object of essentially two papers with the, the authors that uh, uh, have written down, Pietro Corvaia, Julian De Meio, Andrei Rapinchuk, and Jean Boren. So I, I shall start by defining uh, bounded generation, which uh, is a notion can be given in any abstract group, and it may be seen as a strong form of finite generation. And the precise definition is that the group Gamma is said to be boundedly generated if there exists gamma one, gamma r in gamma such that gamma is, uh, so each element of gamma may be written as a product of powers in ordered uh, uh, powers of gamma one times the power of gamma two times the power of gamma r. Of course, this coincides with the finite generation if the group is commutative, but non-commutativity is very essential in this uh, context. So the bounded generators, so let me remark, they need not be distinct. And uh, the terminology is, there is also an alternative one called finite cyclic width. And uh, this number R, the minimum of such number is called the cyclic width sometimes. Let me give some examples. So every virtually abelian or virtually nilpotent group has bounded generation, if and only if it has finite generation. By virtually abelian, for instance, I mean that the group has an abelian subgroup of finite index. So virtually will denote this property of having a subgroup with the property and being of finite index. So here is a criterion to construct uh, new examples of bounded generation from known ones. If we have an extension of the groups G, an extension of H by N, so an exact sequence like uh, displayed there. If N and H have bounded generation, then th the same holds for G, but generally not to the converse. And in particular, a solvable group has bounded generation provided, however, all pieces in the solvability filtration are finitely generated. And however, uh, Warning here, there are solvable groups already inside SL2, which are finitely generated, but not boundedly generated. We give an example in one of the papers uh, that I uh, mentioned. Another example, a result by Malchev, it follows that every solvable subgroup of GL and Z has bounded generation. So in the context of GLMZ, the solvability suffices. Our context is indeed near this context of GLMZ because we shall be concerned with linear groups, so-called for me, a linear group, it means a subgroup of G of K. So the K rational points of an algebraic group G for some field K. And uh, we shall always assume that the, the field is of a, a characteristic zero and usually it will be a number field. And typically the entries of the matrices, so we, we have a group of matrices and that uh, the entries shall be restricted to lying some sub ring of the field usually. For instance, the ring of integers of the number field K. And this context is a context of the so-called arithmetic groups. Let me give now some examples 
which show why we can be interested in bounded generation. Uh, this is because the bounded generation property has been found to have several relevant consequences toward many other independent questions on linear groups. For instance, here are some uh, theorems, some uh, results. For instance, Sarah Pinchuk in 1990 found that the bounded generation has strong implications toward the so-called SS rigidity, which is an important property of <clears throat> linear groups, which means the finiteness of completely reducible complex representation in any given dimension. This also has uh, implication in the dimension of the character, so-called character varieties. I omit precise statements for time reasons, for instance. Sorry. And then uh, we may mention a work of Lubotsky and Platon of Rapinchuk uh, in 92. There are two series of uh, independent works uh, who proved that the congruence subgroup property, which uh, is a famous series of problems, the congruence subgroup property regards, uh, for instance, subgroups of <clears throat> GL and Z, whether they, every finite index subgroup uh, <clears throat> is a congruent subgroup. And there, is a, there are generalizations for arithmetic groups. And uh, this property, this important congruent subgroup property was deduced from bounded generation in some cases by the works that I mentioned. Shalom Willis used crucially this bounded generation for proving the so-called Margulis-Zimmer conjecture. This is again technical. It has to do with commensurability of uh, subgroups of arithmetic groups, of Chevalier groups. So, but it was a co completely independent problem. And uh, it was found that bounded generation had influence on this. And the further implications appear in work of Avni, Lubotsky, and Meir. Let me now give some simple examples, but where it holds and not. For instance, bounded generation does not hold for the perhaps the simplest arithmetic group, non-commutative, SL2Z. In fact, <clears throat> this group contains a non-cyclic free group of finite index. For instance, the group gamma two, uh, which is a subgroup of index two of gamma of two. And uh, it is not difficult to see that uh, this fact that it contains a non-cyclic free group excludes the bounded generation. So, however, it is somewhat surprising that it does not hold for SL2Z, but already for n at least three, Carter Keller proved in 1983 from the bounded generation for all SLN O, so the points with coordinates in <clears throat> a given ring of integers of number field. And actually they proved the bounded generation using only elementary matrices uh, in particular, unipotent matrices. This distinction will be relevant in, in, uh, in the following, in the sequel. And uh, let me remark that for n equal to anyway, uh, the property holds not for SL2Z, but uh, for other rings of integers. And it holds as soon as the uh, ring of integer as an infinite unit group. So we may say almost always. So as shown by Morgan, Rapinchuk, and Suri in 2018. Now let me pause a bit on parameterizations, which is another aspect of my talk and its connection with bounded generation. So let us observe that bounded generation by unipotent matrices allows in particular to 
parameterized polynomially SLN O for N at least three. What the, do I mean with this in the sense that there is a polynomial map which is surjective from some power of the ring into two SL onto SL and O. Namely, we have a matrix in SL and whose entries are polynomials in some number of variables. So we may substitute integers in O in place of the variables and we obtain elements of SL and O and we may obtain, we may find the polynomials so as to obtain every element. This is easy after the theorem of uh, Carter Keller because we observe that if gamma is a unipotent matrix, the entries of the powers of this matrix are polynomials in the variable, in the, in the exponent. And the hence, if we have bounded generation, we need only a finite bounded number of variables to parameterize. This parameterization property is a kind of Diophantine property which can be of independent motivation and interest. Indeed, for instance, there was a question of Skolem going back to long ago, <clears throat> who asked already for n equal to whether SL2z was parameterizable by polynomials. And uh, <clears throat> there were some uh, negative answers in, in few in small number of variables, but uh, surprisingly, Wasserstein in 2010 uh, proved that indeed gave a, gave a counter example to the expectation by proving that in sufficiently many variables, we can parameterize SL2Z by polynomials. And then Larsen, Guyen recently, uh, they extended the thing to rings of integers other than z, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is remarkable because uh, this shows in particular that whereas bounded generation implies a polynomial parameterization, if the bounded generation occurs with unipotence, the converse does not hold because we have remarked above that <clears throat> SL two z is not boundedly generated. So there is there are connections between these parameterizations and the connections, but not uh, uh, double implications. So let us note now that what I uh, say the work for unipotent matrices, but if we also have semi-simple matrices in a in a bounded generation, we still obtain parameterization, but not anymore by polynomials, but we have to introduce also exponential polynomials. And at the other extreme, we have so-called purely exponential parameterizations. If we have only semi-simple elements in a bounded generation, we shall meet this restriction also below. And uh, these observations are easy, uh, in fact, on diagonalizing a semi-simple matrix, we see that the entries of the power are linear forms in the powers of the eigenvalues. And uh, if the matrix is semi-simple, so uh, we find exponentials and not, not, no, uh, not polynomials. So let us go back to bounded generation. Further examples of bounded generation uh, were found for linear groups. The result of Carter Teller uh, on SLN was extended by Tavgen in 91, 1991 to all Chevalier groups of rank greater than one and to most so called quasi split groups, which has to do with Borel subgroups. I will skip the definitions. So 
Anyway, these results and some other ones raised the, the expectation that bounded generation could hold in even greater generality. Let me comment again on the dichotomy unipotent and semi-simple bounded generation. In many of the quoted results, for instance, for SLM, bounded generation occurs with unipotent. But we would like also to allow semi-simple elements for other potential applications of the bounded generation property. And with this in mind, I shall call an isotropic, any subgroup gamma of GLN K that contains only semi-simple elements. And I shall for the moment think of the bounded generation for such a group. This restriction is relevant because these groups, there are very interesting groups which are anisotropic. Here are some examples. There is first the most easy, we can call it trivial case, is uh, constituted by virtually a billion groups generated by semi-simple matrices. So I said, this is trivial case, uh, one quaternions of norm one over a certain ring of S integers. And more generally, the same with quaternions replaced with other division algebras. And the uh, other series of, ortho, uh, of interesting examples come from orthogonal groups of quadratic forms not representing zero. These, these forms are called anisotropic and this is the origin most probably of the terminology anisotropic for the groups. That I, that I am considering. Uh, for me, I, an isotropic group is a group, I repeat, containing only semi-simple matrices. One gets many examples of orthogonal groups working uh, in rings uh, such as Z allowing some denominators, some ring, ring of S integers. We have remarked before that a group with bounded generation by semi-simple elements may be parameterized by purely exponential polynomials. And uh, let me give formally the definition of a purely exponential polynomial. So you see it is a linear combination of with constant coefficients of exponentials of where the bases are fixed and the exponents are linear forms in R variables supposed to take integer val values. So we have the dichotomy that I have already mentioned. So polynomials on one side and exponential polynomials on the other side. This dichotomy appears here in discussing this property, but it appears in Diophante in theory. For instance, it may remind of the Hilbert tent problem. And Matiasiewicz made the last step for proving the undecidability uh, raised by Hilbert by reducing a certain exponential Diophantian equation to usual Diophantian equation. And the same dichotomy appears, for instance, already with the integral points on curves of genus zero. If we have an affine curve, so where we seek for integral points, if it has one point at infinity, we may find infinitely many integral points parameterized by polynomials. Whereas if there are two points at infinity, there are, when there are infinitely many integral points, they may be parameterized by exponentials. And with three points, we have only finitely many integral points with three points at infinity. So uh, this dichotomy appeared already in the Euphantin theory and it appears here again. And uh, despite the behavior, so polynomials being quite different from the exponential polynomial, there was expectation somewhat that some non-trivial 
finitely generated anisotropic groups could be found over rings of S integers and satisfying the bounded generation. However, no such example was found. And uh, studying this problem with uh, Corvaya, Rapinchuk, and Rang in 2021, we found uh, strong limitations to bounded generation in linear finitely generated anisotropic groups. And uh, so let me fix uh, some notation. So K, any field of characteristic zero and gamma in GLN K be a linear group. We have this theorem that gamma is boundedly generated by semi-simple elements. So it need not be an isotropic but it may be gen boundedly generated by semi-simple elements, then it is virtually solvable. So it has a solvable subgroup of finite index. Let me make some remarks on this. One may uh, a little bit uh, generalize the theorem by allowing not only semi-simple elements in a bounded generation, but one may allow a single, no semi-simple generator, and one keeps the same conclusion. And this supplementary result costs some effort. And indeed, already allowing one, uh, there is some effort in the arguments. And an open question, which is, which is the maximum number of such elements that we can allow in order to keep the conclusion? The question is also motivated by examples showing that we can't allow more than four. For instance, SL2 over certain rings of S integers in, inside Z can be generated by, um, by, by five non-semi-simple elements. So, and uh, non semi simple elements lead to ordinary Diophantine equations, so to usual polynomials. So, this explains somewhat the difficulty, and they might even lead to undecidable issues. So, another remark is that there exist a virtually solvable finitely generated linear groups without bounded generation. So, a pure converse of the theorem does not hold. So, and uh, a consequence uh, regards another question which was open for some time regarding a profinite notion of bounded generation. There is indeed a profinite version of the concept. I skip the precise definition, but you may imagine them. It uses the topology of a profinite group and uh, it works the same way. It may be proved that if gamma hat denotes the profinite completion of a group gamma, then if gamma is boundedly generated, then gamma hat is boundedly generated in the profinite sense. And it was an open question where, whether the converse held. And the above theorem, uh, leads to a negative answer, providing examples of finitely generated groups gamma without bounded generation, but such that the profinite bounded generation in, in, instead holds. Assuming moreover that gamma hat is so-called residually finite, which amounts to the topology of the completion being housed off. So to obtain this example, this negative answer to the question, uh, it, uh, I will not uh, be able to do this because it uses a number of results by Platonov and Rapinchuk, and it uses the following corollary of the above theorem. The, the, the above theorem, uh, I recall it works for every bounded generation by semi-simple elements without requiring that the group is an isotropic. But if we also 
insist that the group is an isotropic, then we have a stronger conclusion. It has bound a generation if and only if it is finitely generated and it is virtually abelian. This corollary is a quick consequence of the previous theorem. <coughs> it may be proved because a quick consequence given, taken for granted some general theory, uh, because some general theory proves that a virtually solvable for an, an anisotropic group implies virtually a billion without disregarding boundary generation. This is a general property. So this virtually a billion is the most trivial case of boundary generation. And uh, I profit of this corollary for recalling we work only in zero characteristic, but in positive characteristic, indeed it was shown by Albert Lubotsky Fiber in 2003 that boundary generation implies virtually a billion without further conditions. And they use completely different methods. And conversely, our methods would not apply without, as they stand to, to their context. Let me now add with further results in work also with Julian de Mayo and by means of a partially different method. So related to the previous one, but in fact different, we obtained more precise conclusions concerning not only bounded generation, but concerning also purely exponential parametrization. So, which we have remarked that bounded generation implies either polynomial or, or exponent, uh, parametrization or exponential parametrization depending on the nature uh, of the bounded generation, either by unipotent or semi-simple matrices. But we have also remarked that uh, the, the converse would not hold. So there are groups which are like SL2Z, which admit a polynomial parametrization, but are not boundedly generated. Whereas for purely exponential parametrization, the, the situation is different. It's different. We have the following theorem with Corvaya, the mayor, Pinchuk, and Ren. And uh, we have three equivalent conditions that gamma has a purely exponential parametrization, that gamma is an isotropic and has bounded generation. So in this case, purely exponential parametrization implies bounded generation. And the third equivalence is that gamma is finitely generated and the identity component of its Zariski closure is a torus. And this in particular, essentially, it implies that gamma is virtually a pin. And I recall a usual polynomial parametrization does not generally imply uh, bounded generation. So this result of this theorem, which is more precise than, than the previous one, is a consequence of sparseness of sets obtained from a purely exponential parametrization. This feature of sparseness did not directly appear in the arguments for the former result. Let me mention a bit what I mean for sparseness. You omit detail for time reasons. And uh, this sparseness is expressed by estimates related to heights. So I use the capital according to Paula Cohen Tradkov notation. The uh, capital height means the exponential and the uh, small lowercase height means the logarithmic veil affine heights. So the estimates have this shape. Uh, we bounded the number of elements in gamma of height 
exponential height at most t and coming from a purely exponential parameterization, we estimate them by a power of the logarithm of t. And uh, as is natural to expect somewhat, but uh, uh, it's not clear a priori because we could have exponential polynomials in many variables producing small values. So such an estimate may be, may be even turned into an asymptotic formula so that the number of elements of height at most t are asymptotic to a constant time, a power of the logarithm uh, for some exponent less or equal than the number of variables. This more precise information may be not entirely free of independent interest, but it is not strictly needed for the present applications. So the estimate look natural, but uh, a priori, we could have large, large variables producing small values for the exponential polynomials. So we could uh, have many, many values of the exponential polynomials, even if the variables are large. Similar estimates were produced in the past by other authors. Let me mention just Everest and Sperlinski in 1999. But they worked with restrictions on the exponential polynomials. And the, these restrictions would prevent the applications that we need. The estimates <clears throat> are essentially derived from the following lower bound. We let E be a purely exponential polynomial. And I call a vector of integers minimal for the polynomial if its absolute value, if its norm, a clear norm, is minimal among all the vectors such that the polynomial assumes at those vectors the same value as at the vector x. So the point is that the polynomial could assume the same value for a whole bunch of integral points. And so we cannot expect to have a lower bound for the value, the height of the value in terms of the height of the uh, vector of variables. But this lower bound exists if we restrict to minimal vectors, there is a constant, positive constant, such that the logarithmic height of the value of the polynomial is greater than the constant times the norm of the vector for all minimal vectors, except a finite set of values. So not except a finite set of vectors, but a finite set of values of the polynomials. So this condition of minimality is easily seen to be necessary for the conclusions. And uh, this, minim this estimate is the essential estimate to derive the uh, previously mentioned estimates. And uh, let us compare these upper estimates with some lower bound. So by looking at the total elements, number of elements in the group with the given bound on the height. So the ones coming from a polynomial, a purely exponential polynomial parameterization, there are at most the power of the logarithm of the height. Let me mention some results which say that on, on the contrary, if we look at all the elements of the group, we have many more. So let us restrict to S arithmetic groups. So of the shape uh, S integral points of the of G, where G is an algebraic subgroup of some GLM. And OS is the ring of S integers 
in a number field. In general, with mild assumptions that I will skip, uh, but they are really mild, we have estimates that show that the number of elements of height at most t in, the, in our arithmetic, arithmetic group have polynomial growth. So more than t to the delta for some delta greater than zero. These estimates go back to Siegel, Bale, and others in some important cases related, for instance, to quadratic forms, orthogonal groups of quadratic forms. Siegel wrote a number of paper, um, uh, and uh, there was uh, much research on this. In our paper, we have not really new results on this, but we put together a number of separate the results obtained until recently. And uh, these lower bounds are not strictly needed for the above theorem, but uh, they illustrate the sparseness. So they illustrate that the number of elements in the group of interest for us, uh, the number of elements which we may obtain from uh, an exponential polynomial parameterization, and so from a, bounded from a bounded generating set are really, really very few compared to the whole. And so the boundedly generated subsets are very small. And a fortiori, the group is not boundedly generated. So let me uh, employ the last few minutes of the talk by uh, so uh, surveying uh, into some aspects of some of the proofs. Let me uh, think of the third theorem one, so that uh, I restated about the generation by semi-simple elements implies that the group is virtually solvable. And uh, we have to prove this for all linear groups in, uh, over any field of characteristic zero. And uh, we assume by contradiction that gamma is not virtually solvable, but it has bounded generation with semi-simple elements. And the first point is to reduce to linear groups over number field. So from a field of characteristic zero, this is a common practice. Here, there are some features that do not appear in other, in other contexts. Uh, so by specialization, it is easy to find specialization which maintain the second property. So which maintain the semi-simplicity of the elements. This is easy. It is a little bit more intricate to maintain the fact that gamma is not virtually solvable because the, the derived series could be a priori very long, but one instead uses the uniform boundedness of the length of the derived series which produces uh, the solvability. And, uh, and uh, it is known, this is known inside the GLM. And uh, once that we have this uniform boundedness, one can prove the existence of good specializations which preserve this uh, fact. So this kind of reduction for theorem one has alternatives indeed, because then we use other uh, uh, theorems of the Diophantine type that are known to hold in for arbitrary fields of zero characteristic and that they are even easier to prove over fields which are truly uh, not number fields. But uh, this reduction becomes more, more uh, essential for the second theorem because the second theorem uh, depends for number fields, it depends on estimates involving heights. And uh, 
we haven't uh, uh, very easy notions of heights in fields which are not number fields. There are notions, of course, even in function fields, but uh, these notions uh, do not have the good properties that uh, we have on number fields. And so uh, to work uh, with heights in uh, general fields would be difficult probably. And so the reduction to number fields is uh, to be preferred, especially for the second theorem. So another feature is uh, existence of multiplicatively independent eigenvalues. So to state this, we let gamma one, gamma r bounded generators. We assume that they exist. And we assume that gamma is not virtually solvable. And then to use this hypothesis, we take the quotient g prime, uh, g over the radical so-called, and uh, the radical of g of the component, identity component of g. And the working in g prime, it is not difficult to see that we may further assume that g, g zero is a non-trivial semi-simple group. So we trivial radical. And uh, at this point, we use the theory of Prasad and Rapinchuk of generic elements and one deduces the existence of an element of the group such that the eigenvalues of the element are multiplicatively independent from those of the given hypothetical bounded generators. And we mean that the respective eigenvalues generate subgroups of Q star with trivial intersection, of Q bar star with trivial intersection. And here we use for this the theory of Prasad Rapinchuk. And I would like to remark that this multiplicative independence of values of rational functions, because after all, these eigenvalues may be seen as a rational functions, perhaps not on the group, itself, but on a finite cover of the group, on a variety which is a finite cover. And uh, uh, in a completely independent context, uh, especially of unlikely intersections, uh, this multiplicative independence of values has been studied. And uh, in this uh, view, the, say that the result of Prasad Rapinchuk is not unrelated to theorems obtained jointly with Bombieri and Masser and later refined by Morin and by other authors. And so I wanted to mention this because presumably there could be a useful and interesting uh, interplay between the theory of Prasad Rapinchuk and the unlikely intersection theory of multiplicative independence. I hope that someone perhaps undertakes this uh, analysis. So to sum up, we have obtained the matrix having an eigenvalue, not a root of unity, and such that denoting by mu one mu s, the eigenvalues of the hypothetical bounded semi-simple generators, we have that the corresponding groups are have trivial intersections. And uh, we may assume that all of these eigenvalues lie in a given number field. And now the conclusion, at least for the first theorem, is uh, a simple application of the theory of integral points on sub varieties of Torah GM to the R. We have just to, so this theory is the so called Mordal Lang context in the somewhat easiest case of Toric case, which was, was known before the general Mordal Lang 
and uh, we exploit this theory. And we want to prove that not all the powers of the matrix gamma that we have constructed lie may be expressed as products of powers of the given matrices gamma one, gamma r. Products of powers in this order, however. And uh, assuming the contrary, for each m in z, there would exist exponents depending on m, such that the displayed equation holds. And uh, by diagonalization, we derive from this equation certain exponential equations, like the one which is displayed, where q is a fixed polynomials and the nu's are fixed monomials and the bi's are integers. And uh, I can now conclude and skip the rest. This equation, these kind of equations give, give a variety, a variety defined in the, in the torus uh, gm to the t plus one defined by the displayed equation y equal q of x1, xt. And the point belongs to a finitely generated subgroup of the torus generated by these points. And now we use the theorem of Laurent, which is essentially the mordell lang statement for the toric case. If we have a finitely generated subgroup of some power of GM, and if we have sigma be any subset, then the Zariski closure of this subset has a very special shape. It is a finite union of translates of algebraic subgroups of GM to the M. So, uh, this result goes back to Laurent, but it goes back actually also to previous result by Everse, Van der Poort and Schlickewey, and everything uh, depends on the subspace theorem of Schmidt, which in turn is a higher dimensional version of the theorem of Rolf. And the algebraic subgroups of GM to the N are defined by finitely many binomial equations of the type x1 to the a1, xn to the an equal to one in integers. And this yields a very explicit application of the theorem. And uh, uh, to conclude with this result, in practice, we apply the result with the variety that we have obtained and the points in it and we deduce a contradiction with the multiplicative independence of the eigenvalue, which we had found with the theory of Prasad Rapinchuk. So this concludes the argument and uh, I uh, would stop uh, here my talk. <laughs>